I want to say good morning. My name is Chris Neville, and I'm the program head for Salmon and Marine Interactions, um, which is part of the reef section in Ecosystem Science Division at the Biological Station. And before I get started, I want to acknowledge that my office where I work is located on the traditional ter territory of the Shnunemu people, and I am grateful being, for being able to both work and play here. In today's presentation, um, what's happening with coho salmon in the Strait of Georgia, I'm going to be discussing both published work as well as ongoing work we have um, in hand. And I really want to encourage discussion on what we both what we know and where we go from here. And just so I don't fall off, I'm going to take myself off camera so that um, we don't have internet issues. Oh, let's see if I'm going to actually advance. There we go. I think everyone on the coast heard about coho fishing in the Strait this summer. It was a good news story. And I was told by a number of people that they had not seen fishing like this since the 1980s. The fish were abundant and they were in good shape. Um, the question I ask is, did we expect it? And what does it all mean? Was it an overall increase in salmon survival and returns? And we'll know that as we get into the fall and finish the coho escapement estimates. Or was it a change in the behavior of the fish? Or was it a combination of both? And um, maybe other things as well. And I'm going to suggest it was the latter, but that more work is required to test some leading hypotheses on the mechanisms regulating not only survival, but behavior of these fish. So this here is a figure of catch rates of ocean age one plus coho in our June surveys. And I'm gonna be explaining a bit more about our surveys in a moment. But our surveys are designed for juveniles. And during the surveys, we always do intercept some adults. And when I say one plus, I mean coho that have spent a winter in the ocean. Um, however, not large numbers. And in June of this year, we were catching the most age one plus coho that we had ever seen. I had our team put together the history of what we had seen in previous surveys in June. And that's what I'm showing. To note that in 2020, we had no survey due to COVID. And in 2022, we had no survey due to staffing issues with the vessel. And in 2016 was the sad year that the WE Ricker broke down. And so although we fished, we didn't fish until late July. So it's outside of the time series. So we knew we were seeing them in, in our survey. And when we got back, we were able to, to add to this information, the sport catch in the Strait of Georgia. And we see that the trends were very similar. Now the sport catch is both retained and um, released fish and it's to the end of August. But what this tells us is that what we're seeing in the survey um, is calibrate or is, is similar to what they're seeing in the sports fishery and vice versa. And we asked, was this a demonstration of the physiological shift that we had proposed in 2018 for coho? And would it continue to 2024? Okay, so now I wanna step back a little bit and talk about our surveys. They were started in 1998 by Dick Beamish and 2023 was actually our 25th year of doing these surveys. So the surveys were originally designed for coho salmon. And although we sample all species of salmon, and you'll understand why in a couple of slides, we do these surveys two times a year, in the early summer, late June, early July, and in the fall, September. We use trawl gear because it's an unbiased method of sampling um, salmon in all conditions and across all sizes. And we did go through a number of different gears prior to the to our trawl gear that we use today. Um, it's also similar gear to what's used off the west coast of Washington, in Alaska, and in Russia. So the figure on the top right is the track line that we have been using consistently for the entire 25 years. So this, this line up, whoops, sorry, go back here for the entire 25 years of the survey. The base sampling 
during these 25 years has remained consistent, although what I call value added sampling has been added over the years. And this includes DNA sampling, uh, sampling for energy density, otolith and scale analysis, fatty acid analysis. And although we also fish other areas, as you'll also see in a moment, um, the effort in these other areas, whether it be Wanda Fuca, Discovery Islands, Puget Sound, is variable. And so for comparing across seasons or across years, we stick to the standard survey. And any histograms I show you will be for standard survey only. The bottom figure is just to pay homage to the WE Ricker that conducted the vast amount, the num vast number of these surveys over the 25 year period. So a vast amount of information has been compiled from the surveys. And for any of you that have attended SOPO, a state of the oceans reporting by DFO, you'll be familiar with these histograms. These are the catch rates by season and by year for juvenile salmon. All species are shown here, but the coho are on the top. June's on the left, September's on the right. And remember, this is for that standard track line only that I showed you on the previous slide. The survey also provides information on distribution or changes in distribution between seasons and years. And I'm showing you 2015 simply because in, in that year we managed to fish in Puget Sound in both June and September. Um, so you can get some information about what's happening down in Puget Sound as well. It's also showing the associate, show, associated areas that we were fishing in that year. And over the 25 years, um, distribution trends have remained pretty consistent. Coho salmon are um, throughout the strait in the summer, and then in the fall, they tend to move into the Northern Strait of Georgia. But that does not mean that some of them have left the strait because the surveys have also been able to provide new information. It's not new anymore, but you know, a dozen years ago it was, about, about the residency of coho salmon um, in the strait. And through a combination of our surveys, plus surveys that were done in November and January in the Strait, and with acoustic tagging studies that we did in 2007 and 2008, we demonstrated that the majority of coho salmon that enter the Strait of Georgia remain and rear in this inland sea for an extended period of time. In fact, peak migration of the majority of these fish does not, to the outside waters, does not occur until October, November. And in tagging studies done in 2008, we estimated that there was less than 5% remaining in the strait by December. So research around the Pacific is identifying the importance of the early marine period and overall marine survival of salmon species. This includes work on pink salmon by Ed Farley up in Alaska and work by Graham et al and Duffy and Beauchamp in Washington state for um, Chinook salmon. Therefore, the residence is important for, for research as it gives us a unique opportunity to study these populations over the first four months in the ocean. And it also gives us a specific area to look. So why did Beamish initiate these surveys of juvenile salmon in the Strait of Georgia back in 1998? Well, it's due to a dramatic change in the condition of these fish between the 70s and 90s. Coho salmon was a major sport in commercial fishery in BC, and the peak coho catch of salmon um, in the Strait of Georgia occurred in 1978 with a catch of over 1.4 million fish. However, decline started in the late 1980s, and by 1998, the fishery in the Strait of Georgia was closed largely as a result of concerns for interior Fraser River coho salmon. So we closed it there. And in fact, in, in um, 2002, uh, interior Fraser River coho salmon was listed as endangered, endangered. The dramatic change was in part a combination of a decline in marine survival. Marine survival went from 10% in the 1980s to less than 2% by the 1990s. It was also a change in distribution or in behavior of these fish. 
So prior to the mid-1990s, there was an inside-outside index for coho salmon that was determined based on the proportion of Strait of Georgia coho salmon that were caught inside the Strait of Georgia compared to Strait of Georgia coho salmon that were caught off the West Coast. The proportion varied by year, but typically ranged between 40 to 60 percent. In 1995, there was a dramatic change when virtually all coho salmon left the Strait of Georgia, and this pattern continued into the 2000s. This behavior meant that even without the decline in marine survival, the coho salmon would not have been available to sport fishers in the Strait during the early summer months, as they were still in outside waters. So there's two factors happening, happening and we have to consider them both. Okay, so this figure on the top left is the CPUE of the age one coho salmon in our June survey that I showed you earlier. And you can see that we started to see an uptick in numbers in 2013. This just so happens to be about the same time that the avid anglers were reporting seeing coho in the late spring and summer in the Strait. Now avid anglers is a hook and line sampling program that is, is driven basically by sport fishers that are eager to help provide information to DFO um, on what is happening to coho and Chinook st stocks in the Strait. In 2017-18 winter, there was the first evidence since 19, the 90s that coho were overwintering in the Strait. When the avid anglers were able to sample large numbers of coho in the Strait of Georgia in February. And so the bottom figure now, the red bars, are the stock composition of the teen coho that they sampled in February. And the blue histogram is the stock composition of the coho salmon that we sampled the previous fall in 2017. And they're similar. And this suggested that it was not an isolated stock having this effect, effect coming into the strait, but it was uh, fish from across all Strait of Georgia stocks that were behaving this, this way. And in 2017, Beamish and I proposed that this change in behavior was a result of an improved growth of the juveniles and that these faster growing juveniles achieved a growth threshold or, or, an, or physiological shift resulting in them not having to leave the Strait of Georgia. This would agree the size critical period hypothesis proposed by Beamish and Mencken in 2001. The important caveat is that it would be the fastest growing individuals, growth not size, even though it could be the largest fish, that became resident. Fish that did not have this increase in size would be pre-programmed to migrate out of the Strait of Georgia. Overall, what we were proposing in 2018 was that the early marine period that in the early marine period, there is a process occurring that is similar to what regulates smolting. There is a metabolic threshold that regulates the migration pattern of coho salmon and where they will, will be inside or outside during their ocean winter. Oh. In 2010, um, Beamish and all demonstrated that the abundance of coho salmon in our September surveys was related to subsequent adult returns a year later. The period of time that, that this work was done was during that uh, a declining trend in both the abundance in our CPUEs and, a re and, and reduced total returns. We saw things start to shift in about 2009. So this histogram now is from our September surveys that that original work of, res of, of the relationship between uh, CPUE and returns was built from. So starting in about 2009, we started to see an increase in the CPUE in our fall surveys. When we calculated the early marine survival, that's from ocean entry until September, this was also increasing. Additionally, we were seeing an increase in size. So the average size of coho salmon in the fall was larger. We were not alone in seeing a productivity change around this time. Ian Perry and, uh, and others in 2021 uh, published a, a great report that shows a shift in zooplankton productivity in the Strait of Georgia. 
Jennifer Bolt and colleagues also re reported a shift in condition for juvenile herring in the strait. So there was something happening in the ocean in the Strait of Georgia. In our 2021 paper in fisheries, we proposed that this productivity shift impacted juvenile coho salmon and that it was important to be able to identify these shifts for management um, practices. One of the benefits of the poor returns of interior Fraser coho, I'm always looking for the silver lining, was the extent of information that is now available for this population, including escapement estimates. So for our, our study in 2021, um, we, we identified interior Fraser using DNA analysis and compared the CPUE of this stock with the escapements two years prior. However, that's what I'm showing here in this figure. Um, there really wasn't any relationship until we looked at those productivity periods. Then there were two clear beverage and hold re relationships. We proposed that this meant there was a carrying capacity, there were that there are carrying capacity limits for coho juveniles in the Strait of Georgia, and changes in ocean productivity could have large-scale impacts on returns. Additionally, it meant that once the carrying capacity was achieved, adding more salmon would not change the outcome. We suggested that the increased abundance and growth we observed for juvenile coho following 2009 was directly associated with a higher carrying capacity for this species in the strait. And a similar idea to what Bradford had proposed in 2000 for fresh water carrying capacity. So I had touched pre previously on the relationship between the abundance of coho salmon in our September surveys and subsequent returns published by, um, that, that BEMA was published back in 2010. During the new productivity regime, so this period since 2009, um, the relationship existed, but it started to get noisier. And this noise remained even when we were looking at a stock group level. So this figure here is our CPUE in September and the subsequent total returns to the interior Fraser River the following year. And there is an increasing trend, but it's not significant. However, in this relationship, we started to think what else is happening? And there's these two years. These two years happened to be years when the blob was off the west coast of Vancouver Island. And if we remove these years, the relationship becomes significant and strong. So we propose that ocean warming is resulting in a second regulating period during the first ocean winter. And we have suggest, we suggested that paper some ways of testing this, this hypothesis. So hatcheries. Um, I'm not gonna have time today to get into detail on this because it's a big topic and this is a short talk. So I'll invite you to join a longer presentation that Beamish and I will be doing on November 12th. Give us a call and have a chat about this. Um, we would love to discuss it. However, some thoughts to take home and think about. I've shown you this change in productivity that's occurred in the Strait. During this period of time, since 2003, there's been a 50 to 60% reduction in hatchery releases to the Strait of Georgia. At the same time, pardon? Oh. At the same time, there has no, there has been no trend in the percentage of hatchery fish in our September surveys. It's remained about 30%. So this consistent um, proportion of hatchery fish has occurred, even though the release numbers are declining and our CPUE is increasing. So we asked the question, are hatchery fish utilizing space in the ecosystem of the strait? Um, differently than the wild fish? Could it be due to ocean entry timing or the size of the fish? Also, how can we use hatcheries to test some of the hypotheses I've discussed today? I had mentioned on the previous slide um, up, about how those blob years may have impacted coho salmon in some of the recent years. However, we need to be on the ocean to be able to test some of those hypotheses. 
Otherwise, it's unlikely we're going to get the inf information to understand how ocean warming events will impact coho salmon and other salmon populations in coming year. It's simply outside our lived experiences in the salmon world. So let's talk about 2024. What's going to happen next year? The CPUE of coho salmon in our survey that we just co completed on October 4th of this year was the highest CPUE of coho in 25 years of, of doing the surveys. So this is a good sign that ocean productivity for these fish is remaining strong. In addition, oops, oops, <laughs> figure out where I'm going here. In addition, uh, the size of the fish is the largest observed in the time series. This suggests good early marine growth. And if our hypothesis of ocean distribution is correct, would mean more coho opportunities for sport fishers in 2024. However, we need to complete the work to test these hypotheses and design studies that will continue to provide the, the needed information in coming years. Production appears to be regulated by the carrying capacity of the Strait of Georgia, which occurs in states or periods and can shift very quickly. It means that any rebuilding will be dependent on this carrying capacity and the limits we're currently in. We, um, we need to complete the, the um, we need to do more by the mechanisms uh, of what's regulating this, as without this knowledge, future shifts in climate may cause relationships to no longer be valid. And I must say that we may be approaching another productivity shift in the strait. We've been seeing changes in other fish populations over the last two years. It's just noise right now, but 2010, 11, and 12 were just noise for a few years as well. The exceptional abundance in 2023 may be a combination of improved early marine growth and survival with greater wi winter residency behavior. Knowing the underlying mechanisms will help determine how they will respond as the ecosystem changes. And finally, we are really fortunate. We have the ability to study the early marine period of coho salmon, a critical period for marine survival over an extended period because these fish remain in this region for about four months. We also have 25 years of surveys to build on and to help test emerging hypotheses. The Strait of Georgia example may be one of the best natural laboratories I know of, and we should maximize the benefits of, as what we learn for this species can only help us understand marine survival mechanisms in other species as well. And I think I have one more slide. Oh, my picture is missing. That's interesting. There they are. <laughs> I have to thank everyone that has helped on the surveys over the past 25 years. It's been too numerous to, to name them all. This happens to be our crews, our team on our September 2023 20, uh, survey. And um, I, I hope that people in the future want to keep on doing this kind of work. Well, thanks everyone. Um, I'm speaking to you today from the shared territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Slaver Tooth nations. Um, and I just want to start off by acknowledging my co-authors, um, uh, Sonia Reger, who has uh, been coordinating this uh, this our, our field program for 6PPD quinone. Uh, Sean Jun Lau is our chemist uh, who's developed a LCMSMS method for measuring uh, 6 PBD quinone, as, as well as a number of other analytes in our lab, and uh, Kara Skelly, who's also a uh, one of my technicians in my in my lab here in, in West Vancouver. So this study that I'm going to be presenting to you today is really um, we launched this effort uh, shortly after the the uh, pivotal paper came out in 2020, um, and uh, re started reaching out to a number of of people working on the ground, a number of organizations and um, uh, stream keepers and First Nations and, and NGOs and so on to really uh, determine uh, and, and create a long list of sites that we wanted to target. So we were being really trying to identify and characterize six PPD quinone concentrations and ultimately hotspots in salmon habitat in, in British Columbia. 
So I want to acknowledge a number of our partners and, and collaborators, and it's a long list of, of individuals that are working in support of this uh, initiative and this study. Um, and without their participation, this 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 work would not have would not be possible. So with respect to Pacific salmon, we know that they are important uh, to First Nations, uh, recreational commercial fisheries, as well as our resident killer whales. Um, many populations are endangered uh, and or threatened. Um, and there's, with respect to contaminants, there's really a large gap in our knowledge um, regarding contaminant concentrations, as well as the effects in both adult and juvenile salmon originating from can uh, Canadian rivers, um, as well as in their freshwater and marine habitats. So a large uh, effort when I first got hired by DFO and early 2019 was to develop a research program largely um, focused on the southern resident killer whales as well as the St. Lawrence estuary belugas, but also within their food web. So a lot of our work leading up to present day has really been focused on, um, on looking at contaminant levels in Chinook salmon, but also shifting to other uh, Pacific salmon species. With respect to contaminants, there are over 30,000 uh, chemicals on, on in being used in high volume uh, in, in Canada's marketplace. And contaminants have been identified as one of the greatest threats to natural ecosystems and specifically to juvenile salmon health and survival. And with respect to 6-PPD quinone, it has been identified as, as, a, as a contaminant of concern. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So yeah, the trouble with um, with salmon is that they do have complex history and habitat needs. And, and therefore, when we're looking at contaminants, they are exposed to multiple exposures along their their journey. So whether or not you're looking, you're thinking in the context of juvenile Chinook versus adult um, or returning or returning salmon. With respect to um, research pertaining to um, Urban runoff mortality syndrome. This has been 20 plus years of research, um, largely it led uh, led out of Washington State, um, where they noticed toxic injury and death to up to 90% of adult returning coho returning to urban and semi-urban waterways. Um, so this was first reported uh, between it, kind of late 1990s, and then this was later linked through a uh, large amount of research efforts to increase stormwater runoff and tire associated contaminants. And then of course, as, as many of us are aware of, um, the toxic agent of injury was then identified to be um, 6-PPD quinone in, in the Tian et al. paper in 2020. which as I mentioned, led to some of the work that we've been doing here on this coast, which was to launch a uh, um, large scale monitoring program um, in a number of BC salmon uh, bearing streams. So since, yeah, it's a sort of 2021 uh, late, um, we have been looking at, uh, I think we're, what we've been continuously looking at for two years, monitoring during every rain event um, in 40 different streams. And now we've expanded our program to over 70 different um, uh, uh, salmon bearing streams where we're measuring 6-PPD quinone as well as other, uh, as, whether, as well as other analytes um, during rain events. So our kind of our criteria or our protocol for when we go out, and it's just not, it's not my team, but as I, on that second slide there, it's numerous teams are going out and, and that's being coordinated by Sonia. So we uh, typically have a threshold of, of a 48 hour dry period. And we wanna look at, we want to capture rain events that are anywhere between, uh, anywhere are ex equal to or exceeding five millimeter of rainfall or anticipated rainfall. And so we sample typically before uh, as well as during and then after a rain event. And, and we've sampled, as I mentioned, these are salmon, it's typically salmon bearing creeks. And in addition to sa sampling in the creeks at either one or two sites, sometimes three, we also try to sample road runoff. So when we go out, we're sampling, uh, one example is, this is Burn Creek, um, a site within Metro Vancouver. This is during the, a, a first flush, so after a um, uh, long dry summer season. And when we get, get the first flush, you can get a sense of how dark the water is. 
Uh, when we go out, we take flow meter measurements, turbidity, we have our YSI, um, so in addition, and then we sample water. So in addition to sampling for the water for 6 ppd quinone, for a subset of our, our, our sites um, and rain events, we've sampled the parent compound, 6 ppd as well as diphenylamine, which is another tire associated contaminant, but also a contaminant that's uh, present and used in a number of industrial uh, practices. And then we've also looked at uh, measured in met uh, for metals. So with respect to toxicity to this, to 6-PPD quinone, um, uh, as it remains so far, coho appear to remain the most sensitive species with respect to salmonids. And then that's followed by brook trout um, or a steelhead or a rainbow trout and then, and then Chinook salmon. So our lab has been um, participating in uh, or carrying out um, lab-based toxicity um, exposures on a number of Pacific salmon species. And, and uh, my PhD student, Bonnie Lowe, um, who's co-supervised by myself and Vicki Marlett at SFU, recently published a paper last year with um, the 41 uh, nanograms per liter um, uh, LC50 value uh, for coho salmon. And then the previous, the one after that is the TN et al uh, revised value. So just giving you an idea of, in the table there of sort of the range of values that have been published to date from, from uh, many people out there uh, conducting toxicity studies, but really looking at a, a wide variety of, and orders of magnitude in, in the context of even between coho salmon to Chinook salmon sensitivity, and that's within a 24 hour uh, um, exposure uh, for lethality, you're seeing three orders of magnitude in, in terms of difference. What that doesn't speak to is, is what are the sublethal effects? And that's something else that my lab and, and many and other labs are, are starting to explore as well as what as well as the toxic mode of action. So what is the mechanism of action that's that's contributing to this lethality? And and what could it be um, maybe impairing or uh, in juveniles or returning adults uh, when they come back? So this is some of our preliminary results for our field program. This, these are six PPD quinone levels. So you've got six PPD quinone and nanograms per liter on the y-axis. And then you have a number of, uh, you have a select few of our sites um, where we've pulled the data together and we're working on a paper right now. And this is, so you're looking at um, the group of sites, uh, Metro Vancouver sites, uh, to the left, and then you've got a few, a few sites in around Victoria, Sydney area from Vancouver Island. So just giving you an idea that, you know, average levels are either approaching and certainly in, in the Metro Vancouver area are exceeding um, effects levels concentration. So that LC50 value that I presented earlier to you for coho salmon during rain events. And that's generally exceeding for the most part at, in our Metro Vancouver sites at, um, at, at uh, within a, about 90, if not more, at nine, above 90% of the time uh, that, that we're sampling during those rain events. And then in terms of the concentrations that we're seeing from a difference from sampling before versus sampling during, we're seeing a, a kind of a fold increase of anywhere in the range of between 90 to nine to, to, to around 90 fold increase in those six PPD quinone concentrations and then dropping off during the after, um, after sampling event. And then some, some other uh, ways we're looking at the data is relating 6-PPD quinone concentrations to say the number of dry days leading up to the rain event. So we are seeing a relationship in the number of dry days to a full change relationship between that uh, sampling uh, before, uh, during to the before period, as well as we're seeing an increase in 6-PPD quinone concentrations associated with the flow. And we're also, so starting to look at stage discharge relationships at our at our various creeks that we've been um, monitoring. Um, with respect to some of the other chemicals, I've, we've just plotted an example of some of our preliminary results with for the parent compound. So again, you're seeing that elevated concentrations during the rain event in the top left graph there for the 6-PPD parent compound, diphenylamine, same similar profile. And then just giving you an idea that again, we are reaching those levels of concern in our salmon bearing streams during the rain event that 
if you're relating back to the uh, lethal concentration, uh, you'd expect at least 50% of the population to um, uh, uh, be dying. Uh, this is another relationship showing you uh, the relationship between diphenylamine, that other tire associated compound, and, and 6-PPD quinone. So just building on that relationship between the bar graphs and the previous plot, um, and just showing you that we are seeing, you know, uh, correlation between um, other uh, tire associated chemicals and 6-PPD um, and quinone um, when we're going out and doing our sampling. So this does raise, um, you know, additional questions to what are the impacts um, that could be posed by other chemicals that are occurring um, uh, associated with uh, road runoff and so on. And then we're relating this back to other indices, like what is the relationship between land use and 6-PPD quinone concentration? So really trying to tease out and, and eventually try to uh, work with other um, groups that we've partnered with at UBC and 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 partnerships on Vancouver Island who are, um, are helping to build out uh, some of our monitoring program and additional sites so that we can identify and start to model and characterize hotspots um, across uh, coastal BC here. Um, and then just uh, just bringing back to the LC25 just for Chinook salmon. Um, as I mentioned, it was. Uh, uh, significantly higher than 6-PPD quinone concentration. Then if we're thinking, if we're trying to link back our Chinook salmon LC25, just pointing out again, I, I mentioned that sort of that three orders of magnitude difference that we were seeing between Chinook salmon and coho salmon for juveniles. And, and just pointing out that for the lethal concentration at 25% of the population, that's considerably higher the value that we're seeing at at, at forty four thousand nanograms per liter is considerably higher than what we are at, what has actually been detected in salmon bearing waterways as well as in straight road runoff uh, reported in literature to date. So just giving some perspective there. That's not to say that there may not be sublethal effects that are happening um, uh, well below this this level of of concentration. So just to kind of bring everything together, is 6PB quinone posing a threat to Pacific salmon? And I'm kind of bringing in our resident killer whales because I work, uh, uh, a component of my research is on the Southern resident killer whales as well as Northern resident killer whales. Um, it, I think we can safely say that 6PB quinone has likely been impacting the health and survival of coho salmon in our urban and semi-urban um, areas of BC for decades. And that's without us even knowing it. Um, and then Chinook salmon, as I pointed out uh, through our, our earlier research, and now we've looked at um, Chum and, and coho and, and further and other additional supporting research that's been done with road runoff in, in Washington state, support that Chinook salmon appear to be uh, less sensitive than coho salmon. I think with respect to our monitoring program, we've got another at least two more years of sampling that's gonna provide stronger insight and hopefully feed into our hotspot analysis that is certainly underway. And we'll get some of these preliminary or subset of the results published on the four, first 40 sites um, early next year. And then ultimately the extent to which 6PB dequinone may affect salmon stock abundance is certainly, um, it still remains unclear. So with that, I just wanna thank, uh, thank you and I'm happy to take any questions. Wonderful, thank you for that great presentation and for the flexibility as technology through several curveballs there. Um, <laughs> Go ahead, folks, and please feel free to raise your hand if you have questions. I see lots of claps, which is great. Or to drop them into the Q&A. And Chris, I'll give you a heads up. You may have seen this, but there are some follow-up questions for you there, but I wanna make sure we start with questions for Tanya. Um, the first Tanya question for you is, um, from Cindy asking, do we know if the tire industry is working on tires that don't contain these chemicals? And any insight you have there? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I don't have a lot of insight with respect to that. I was attending a call with US EPA um, and our environmental regulators here, ECCC. Um, 
And I think it certainly uh, is and should be on the radar. And um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm not. Uh, I don't. I don't have a. Um, I think if I recall correctly from the meeting, I think there were incentives, and but I don't know if it was directly coming from the tire um, organizations themselves to incur like to to start for research aimed at that direction. But yeah, I don't have a, a full answer for you on that. That's fair. There are so many pieces to problems yeah. like this, right? You can, uh, yes, the, yeah. In the news, that's right. In the news yesterday, there was an article uh, reporting on the US EPA that they have agreed to look into that. Yeah. And I know that um, CTAC recently hosted a, a seminar series on 6PPDQ, and, and one of them um, from SFEI's presentation talked about some of the mitigation strategies, including alternative tire designs that yeah. are more to reduce friction. So we can also similarly share that out um, with the group. For oh, and I, and I I believe um, on the Canadian side, they're looking at ways to reduce the amount of, um, yeah, kind of particles that are, are being um that are being leached into our, not leach, but yeah, offloaded in, from the tires into the environment. Right. Joel, I saw you pop on. Was there a question that caught your eye? Otherwise I'll keep moving through the Q and A. Why don't you keep moving? I do have a question, but I'll, I'll hold yeah. it until you end. Um, so one of these questions is, other than land use and salmon bearing habitats, what other parameters are being used to evaluate hotspots? Like other than what we are measuring right now and kind of linking up with. I think the um, interpretation I would add on to that is in addition to the data you all are collecting to show where yeah. there are high levels, when when that mm -hmm. goes into management actions, what other kind of variables are being used to prioritize either where you're going to look for data and or what you do um, on the back end with that data? Right. So I think like originally when we, we first set out to um, identify sites, well, what my team, I think, well, what I first said, I, I was just reaching out to, initially I was seeing who it had had reported or noticed any uh, die-offs from uh, associated rain events. So that was, you know, those were initial um, areas that we targeted or reached out and just tried to connect with people. And then it just uh, built built out from there. So we've connected with municipalities and so on in terms of their concerns. And and so ultimately this will be feeding back into to help inform municipalities on where those hotspots are, are um, where we're locating the, those hotspots and so on so that they can then prioritize areas that um, may be of relevance for new environmental and near engineering initiatives uh, that they, that could be targeted to help. Um, reduce tires, a tire associated or in general road runoff related impacts. Great. And then we have two other questions that, that get at some of the, the impacts here. One is just about repeated exposure to 6PPDQ and whether there's almost a resilience um, for mm -hmm. fish that, that survive it. Um, and then also on a, related to that, just the striking difference between um, salmonids, if you have any hypotheses as to what might be driving that. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, yeah, why are coho so, so much more affected? Um, and I think, um, I think we're still in the beginning um, realms of, our, of everyone's research in, in terms of understanding that. Um, and there's lots of, of labs that are underway looking at that, like my lab is, but we, uh, is looking at anything from gene expression to metabolite profiles to protein, protein expression, the inner workings between different omics reactions to histology to generate insight into that question. And I know a number of other labs um, uh, Brinkman in uh, Brinkman's lab, as well as many, as well as others in Washington State, um, are trying to answer that. So I think it's a bit too early to um, 
to um, to give a, a comprehensive answer to that question, but it certainly um, is is piqued my interest, and in, and in certainly within when you're thinking about the regulation of chemicals, and that we, you know, we how do we how are chemicals regulated and that the, oftentimes they're looking at the physical chemical properties of a chemical or they're limiting it to uh, lab controlled studies on maybe one species or two species in question, right? So this really raises the question of, well, how effective is that when we're often using rainbow trout as, as a target species when that isn't even the most sensitive species in question, certainly from this perspective. So what are we missing when we're looking, when we're using these approaches? Um, we're not really, yeah, we're not, we're not ultimately targeting uh, the most sensitive species. So I think that <clears throat> to me, that speaks volumes about um, how things have been carried out from a regulatory perspective. So can we do better in the future and what can this teach us? And, and certainly what, and what can, what can we learn? And, and essentially with, trying to and just bringing it back to municipalities and what they can do as well um, and what the tire industry can take home from this too but just it it's not just six ppd quinone but i want to come back to that there are thousands of chemicals in our marketplace and a thousand new chemicals that are coming on the market each year so you know this is an ongoing problem and issue that we need to be making made aware of and then with respect to salmon we need to take action in, in creating salmon habitat uh clean salmon habitat um uh for them to thrive and survive and recover because um given their their uh, current state <laughs> yeah i appreciate that and i, I think i appreciate i think i skipped the, the systemic skipped aspects over first of question. changes that then that's okay. And we can yeah. also follow up offline. I know we're getting close to time. I see Howard's hand. Um, so Howard, why don't you, you go ahead and let Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank good talk. Good, very interesting research, Tanya. Um, and this isn't a very scientific question. It's like <clears throat> I'm wondering about when you see places, roads, usually in rural areas where there's tire tracks all over the place, kids just laying down rubber. Is that something of a point source? I mean, this is an estuary. I, you know, you don't think about this uh, level of uh, pollution, but uh, could that be like yeah. a serious location that should be part of a study? If it's, I guess it would need to be near some salmon stream, but uh, you know, this is an estuary. Yeah. Well, I think, well, I think we had that kind of raised even um, at a talk I gave. Um, couple of months ago to patch it up First Nation on the uh, west coast of Vancouver mm -hmm. Island, where there was concerns about the amount of traffic they were seeing on their, you know, their uh, old logging roads, but also within the creeks themselves when they're, you know, they're dry and, and so on, right? Um, but I think um, it's a good question. It's something that could certainly be explored. Um, with respect to just looking at the concentration range that we're seeing from, you know, Victoria to uh, or a Metro Vancouver, you know, even with and and even within Victoria and Sydney, um, they are significantly lower than what we're seeing in Metro Vancouver. So you know, there there is you know, the volume of cars, the amount of the number of dry days, I think does play a factor, of course, um, in terms of the, the amount of uh, material that's going to be washed into these creeks. The, so just there's, I think there's lots of considerations to, to uh, yeah, to, to consider. And then the other things I've thought about that we, we're starting to look into is, you know, the recycling and reuse of tires in terms of playgrounds um, and uh, turf fields, you know, th th these are initiatives that are supposed to be um, improved, like, you know, we're, we're recycling things, we're recycling product products, but what is that, you know, is that creating another potential source as well, right? So I think there's lots of questions in terms of areas that we could look at, but also, yeah, different types of areas. Thank you, Tanya. And that speaks to the ever evolving nature of the scientific process. 
Um, but we are at time. Lots of great questions. We'll try and follow up offline for those. Um, just want to do a quick shout out for the next Salish Sea Science Roundtable. That'll be on December 5th from 1230 to 130. And we'll have an update from the Marine Survival Project by Liz Duffy and Isabel Pearsall. Um, we will also have our first of the quarterly in-person happy hours. So hope that um, folks can join us potentially at Stoop Brewing in Capitol Hill at 5 p.m. You know, for our Canadian counterparts, that'll be a little more challenging. Um, we'll have one up your way next quarter. Um, but Joel, final thoughts to wrap us up. Just real quick. First, thanks to Mario Larson, as always, for doing all the organizing and for the mentor for the, uh, the running the show and dealing with all the technical issues. And I just wanted to make sure, um, I wanted to thank the science panel for Future Sound, but also particularly this month, uh, Eddie Kennedy and his group at DFO for readily raising their hand when we first had this idea. It's like, who wants to help us? And uh, Eddie was the first one to raise his hand. So um, I really appreciate it. And it really enriches our conversation and be able to go virtually across the border and see what's going on up, up your way. So thanks, Eddie, and, and to your group. We'll see you on the fifth.